to Nutrition Rounds with Dr. Danielle Bellardo, the podcast for anyone interested in learning about plant-based nutrition through an evidence-based approach. Every week, we share insights and interviews with physicians who are leading experts in nutrition and health. Whether you've been plant-based for many years or are still searching for the perfect diet, Nutrition Rounds will inspire and empower you to live your healthiest life backed by science. Now here's your host, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, MD. Hello, hello, and today we are on Nutrition Rounds, and it is a special episode because we are joined with Casey. Hey, what's up, everybody? Casey's our producer for Nutrition Rounds, and I love her dearly. She's the reason why you guys can um, hear this every episode. She does all of the production for everything and tries to get me a little more technologically savvy so that way <laughs> we can improve the audio. Hey, we're learning together, Danielle. This it's is like, amazing. This is, a, this is a passion project for both of us. So. Casey's the best. Um, so... Guys, um, today's episode is really special because today we are introducing you to the five doctors who are joining our plant-based summer challenge. So in case you don't already know about this, um, most of you know that I love reaching everyone on social media about plant-based nutrition, explaining the health benefits and things like that. I love reaching anyone, whether or not you're in healthcare, whether you are a healthcare provider or not. I love reaching just anyone and anyone and discussing nutrition. But I do have a special place in my heart for education educating physicians about plant-based nutrition and the multiple benefits and the way we can really prevent and reverse a lot of chronic disease through nutrition. And so the reason why I offered this challenge up is because I thought it would be a good opportunity to coach five physicians, give them one-on-one coaching from me and a great health coach, Karen, who you'll meet later on in the podcast, and help them transition to a plant-based diet this summer. So I offered it out on social media essentially as a challenge for the summer, we were going to provide this one-on-one coaching and over 500 physicians from around the world signed up. It was so crazy. After 500 emails, I had to like literally stop answering. (laughs) I mean, I couldn't answer them all. It was impossible. I'm a cardiology fellow in my last year of training. I don't have enough time to coach 500 people, although I wish I did. But I was so honored that so many doctors from literally everywhere really wanted to join the challenge. Just really warmed my heart to think how many people are interested in plant-based nutrition. And it also made made me, you know, realize how many people want to go plant-based. They really don't know how. And of course, I'm constantly providing on my social media different resources. And there's so many great plant-based starter guides out there. And I list them all the time. And, you know, so I definitely just have hope that things are changing in medicine. But we chose five doctors from all around the world to do this coaching with, and they are wonderful. And you're going to hear from them on this episode. They are from everywhere. They're from California, Michigan, and even Saudi Arabia. And we have two men, um, three women, uh, two cardiologists. One is a advanced heart failure cardiologist. So very excited about that. We have a dermatologist. Um, we have an oral surgeon and an emergency medicine physician. So we span all the specialties and it's they're all really, really enthusiastic and super excited to join the challenge. So what we're going to do for 10 weeks is follow them, follow their progress. They're all omnivores and they're all interested in plant-based diet, but haven't taken the leap yet. So they are going to get coaching from Karen, who you'll meet shortly in the podcast. Um, She is a health coach and she's an RN and she does a lot with plant-based nutrition education. And we've provided them with a ton of resources and we're going to check in with them throughout the summer. Um, We're also going to do some really nerdy but cool metrics and studies. So we, uh, I had everyone send me a basic metabolic panel and a lipid profile before we started. And then additionally, I had everyone send me their weight and different measurements like waist circumference and things like that and blood pressure. So because we're doctors, we had to make a scientific experiment out of it and it's going to be really fun. So this episode's also super uh, educational, not just because we're interviewing these wonderful, fantastic physicians who are about to go plant-based, but also because we discuss a lot of how to go plant-based from step one. And we interview Karen and she's a health coach and she discusses a lot of her tips and tricks for going plant-based. And so I also want to discuss this with Casey. She's been plant-based for quite some time. She has her whole family's plant-based, including her daughter. And so Casey, I wanted you to give everyone your rundown on what are some of your tips for someone that, you know, wants to go plant-based and they're thinking about it, but they don't know what to do. Yeah. And this quick correction with you, Danielle, my, my daughter is, but my husband 
is not, but he's made a lot of positive changes to get there. So that's it's amazing. Yeah, so that's a work in progress. So if you're listening and you think you can't do it because your spouse isn't there yet, like don't get discouraged because the more they see you do it, the more they'll want to jump on board. So stay consistent with that. You know what? I love that because I think that, you know, we don't have to be all or none with, especially, you know, I think that that's one that's actually really inspiring because it, it shows that you can do it even if we can only control ourselves. We cannot exactly. control our loved ones. And it's just amazing to hear that you can do it even if your significant other isn't plant-based, you know? So I think that that's actually inspiring for a lot of people. And I'm sure that if you weren't doing this, you wouldn't be eating as much plant-based, even if you've gotten him even, oh. you know, <laughs> plant predominant at all. Absolutely not. I mean, we've been married for four years, but together for 10. So it's the same thing. You just have to respect their journey because Absolutely. like, this has been a process for me, just researching and learning for years. And he hasn't been on that same path. So I can't expect him to be where I am, where I'm, I'm at currently. Like that's something he has to gradually do on his own. And I can yeah. just live by example. And that's what I try to do every day. So yes, people just stay, stay consistent. Uh, but yeah, no, my, my first tip, Danielle is to don't be so hard on yourself, but I know I you get that. excited for all of these changes and you, you want to see the results right away, but you make one mistake or one slip up. And then you're just so hard on yourself that a lot of people will give up way too soon. But this is all a process, right? And it's progress over perfection always. And I mean, I just think about my own journey and I'm, I'm 31. I've been plant-based almost four years, getting closer to that. So I mean, so the first, you know, 27 years of my life, like I ate a lot of animal products, probably almost every meal I had animal products. So like this was just a process of doing yo-yo diets and all of these diets that people did. You know, I did the paleo and the keto and all of these things that didn't work. So just work yourself there, like the stepping stones that work for you. And um, if you if you mess up, it's it's not a mess up. Just jump back in. And like, if your only thing you change this year is you switch to almond milk, like that's a victory. So don't be hard on yourself. Just make those little changes uh, every day. That is such beautiful advice. I said the exact same thing to all five of the doctors because one of them mentions to me like, well, what if I slip up? I was like, well, you slip up. You're human. Like, that's okay. And and I find that I've had so much more success with patients by having the mentality that, you know, every change is a huge step than trying to scare them into an all or nothing mentality. I mean, that's just not the way you help someone to transition to plant-based diet. And I think that, you know, I do have patients, of course, that will 100% go from zero to a hundred plant-based overnight and they're motivated and that's where they're at. And I respect their journey. That's amazing, but not everyone can do that. And so I love that advice. Don't judge yourself and don't be hard on yourself. Just, you know, that'll only set you back even more. So I love that advice. Just keep moving forward. Right. And the, uh, the second piece of advice that I have is first off, just don't <laughs> feel restricted at all. Like tonight, get a notebook out and write down Every meal that you love to eat, whether it's a recipe you love or just uh, just a meal that's prepared or just different meals maybe you would get at a restaurant and just write all those things down because you don't have to feel like you're restricted and you can't eat the things that you love. You can definitely eat the things that you love. You just figure out, have, have to figure out a way to kind of veganize them. And with, yeah. uh, with using Google, like you have the best recipes at your fingertips. And not to mention, you know, you guys are going to have access to Karen. And, you know, just following her on social media, she's going to post incredible recipes and big shout out to Karen. She's somebody that I respect a lot as well. I think she's amazing. And also shout out to Karen's cashew cheese mac and cheese because- Oh my God. We oh talk about that. We talk about that in our interview. <laughs> I had to. It's so great. Like that recipe is so amazing. I remember like I had to, um, I had to make the mac and cheese for like Thanksgiving <laughs> last year. And that was actually like- a crowd favorite it's for people favorite. that were non <laughs> for non vegan. So that's you. I use it as dipping sauce. I use it it's for like everything. So um, Karen yeah, Rocks. Karen yeah. is amazing. But yeah, so just write down those recipes. You know, if your favorite recipe is, you know, if it's pizza, like look up, you know, how to make a vegan pizza or a veggie pizza or lasagna. Like there's amazing vegan lasagnas available. You know, just googling that. So uh, whatever foods you usually would eat in the week and that you love. Figure, just figure out how to, to just veganize it. And then once you start to learn those alternatives, 
it just gets easy, right? You just get used to that. And then it's just, yep. it's not a big deal. And you can make all these meals that you love. So you are not restricted in, in any way. I love that. That's excellent advice. You can literally veganize yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the third is just the more consistent you are with making these changes, though, the more your friends and your family will take you seriously. And I know that that's a huge reason why people don't want to make this change. That They're worried about what their family will say, what their friends will say, how they'll handle the holidays. And and I get it because we've both dealt with that, Danielle. You know, I it, it's it can be hard sometimes. So I, what I noticed for myself is the first few Thanksgivings were hard. But then like that third Thanksgiving, they're like, man, she's still doing this, right? So uh, that's when like I started to get like really great questions from family yeah. members that I never would have thought would go that route. Like, you know, my dad is somebody that just grew up hunting and eating so much meat and all of this. And he's been vegan for almost two years now. And like, that's somebody I would never wow. expect to have those questions and want to go that route. So don't be too hard on your family. Like you had those feelings probably at one time too. But the more they see you just being consistent and, and coming from a loving place, not just like attacking with like angry backlash. If they have questions, answer in a loving way. If, if they're kind of pushing back, just give them as much love as possible. But um, just consistency and they'll, and they'll take it more seriously and ask really great questions. That is so beautiful. I love that because uh, I'm a little spoiled because my entire family is yeah. vegan. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that uh, I, I think that that is just such an excellent point because you know that is the best way in in your life is just to lead by example and just let everyone come around to being comfortable with it at their own time and be for sure prepared for the questions of where you're going to get your protein. I mean, you're gonna get every, <laughs> every holiday, they're going to ask you, where do you get your protein? I just have a prepared answer. I have tons of posts on that. <laughs> but, yeah, you have to study up before those meals. Yeah, exactly. You should answer a few key points before uh, meals with people that are not vegan. Even though my family's, <laughs> my entire family's vegan, my sisters, everyone's husbands are vegan. But um, oh, actually, sorry, my middle sister's husband's not vegan, but um, he's the <laughs> oddball. But um, the other than you know, for me, I am constantly with non vegans at work. I mean, all the time. I'm the only vegan at my work. And so, you know, I, I think that you just, you know, that there's going to be a few questions that will come up and it'll be the protein question. It'll be like, are you eating so many carbs? And these are very easy things to answer. And I agree with you. I think it's a really good point to, to answer things with it from a loving and compassionate way. People, when they are feeling insecure about their own lifestyle choices are more likely to respond in a positive way if you come to them in a positive way. Sure. Um, and, and it'll, they'll be less likely to be defensive. So I think that's such great advice. Absolutely. And my last tip is to eat when you're hungry. And I know you probably hear this all the time, mm -hmm. Danielle, it's, you know, somebody, you know, goes vegan for a week and they're just like, I can't handle it. I'm way too hungry. And a lot of the times the problem is, is they don't realize that they have to up their consumption of whole foods because they're so nutrient dense, but they're not as calorically dense, right? So you have to so increase true. the amount of foods that you're eating, really in increase those nutrient dense foods. And just be aware of that and just listen to your body. Like if you're hungry, eat. Like you don't have to be set to three meals a day. If you want to eat throughout the day, that's cool. If that's what you're, you, know, you feel your body needs. So just make sure you're getting enough calories. If you have to even track that for a while, not saying you have to do that every single day, because I mean, a lot of people don't like to do that every single day. But even if you take like three days and just track what you eat, see how many calories you're taking in just as kind of like a meter, that way, you know how much to adjust that to really meet the, the caloric need that you really need to not be hungry and to have the energy that you need to have. So if you're kind of like on the fence, because you're like, I don't want to be too hungry. Just monitor it, eat more food, listen to your body. And, um, you know, you don't have to live off just iceberg lettuce, like just eat the veggies, exactly. eat the veggie pizza. <laughs> There's so many options. And I know Karen's going to hook you guys up with incredible recipes that you're not going to even have that problem. But yeah, eat when you're hungry and you'll be good. I love it. That's great. Um, well, the next thing we're going to do, since Casey just dished out her amazing advice and her easy to follow tips, is we're just going to answer a couple, just a few of your common questions that I get often about people that transition to a plant-based diet. And then we're going to get to our interview with Karen, our health coach, and then you'll hear from the rest of the doctors. So Casey's got our questions. Yes. And the first question is from Sarah. 
And it says, I'm gaining weight on a plant-based diet. What should I do? Okay. So the reason this is an important issue to tackle is because although 99 of 100 people will lose weight on a plant-based diet, occasionally someone will come to me and tell me they've gained weight. So first and foremost, the the reason why people often lose weight on a whole food plant-based diet is because it's a diet that is nutrientally dense, but calorically poor. So most of the foods on a whole food plant-based diet, you're focusing on fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, have tons and tons and tons of nutrients, but they're lower in calories. So often, and they're very high in fiber. So oftentimes people find it very easy to lose weight. Um, They're not eating processed foods and they lose weight easily. But every once in a while, I get this question and it's a very valid question. Um, So This happens usually because of one of two reasons. Most commonly, A, when someone transitions to a plant-based diet and they tell me they're gaining weight, most commonly they're still eating processed foods. So even though some foods may be marketed as vegan or plant-based, they can still be filled with crap. So stick with whole natural plant-based foods as minimally processed as possible. You know, um, things like Beyond Burger and stuff like that, I mean, that's like a once in a while treat if you really want it. But just because it's vegan does not mean it's healthy. And I've discussed this at length. So stick with true whole foods, plant-based foods that are not processed. And then the second reason why this often happens is, and I'm telling you, it doesn't happen that often, but the second reason why someone may run into trouble with gaining weight on a plant-based diet is because they're just eating too highly calorically dense foods, like nut butters and large doses of grains. So the thing is, is that regardless of diet, Okay, we cannot trick basic biochemistry and thermodynamics. We can't. So in order to lose weight on a whole food plant-based diet, similar to every diet on this earth, similar to keto diet, similar to paleo diet, every diet cannot fool thermodynamics. In order to lose weight, you have to have a caloric deficit. Okay, so your calories in must be less than your calories out. And one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So that's a 500 calorie deficit a day if you want to lose one pound a week. And one to two pounds a week is a healthy amount of weight loss. So essentially, you know, this is actually easy to accomplish on a plant-based diet because it's so naturally low in calories and high in fiber and nutrients. But every once in a while, I meet someone that encounters this and, and it can be easily solved with tracking your meals. So I will say that I do find that tracking calories when someone is cha- and tracking nutrients and everything when someone is changing diets to be incredibly helpful. And the reason why is because sometimes people give up on a diet very fast without being able to actually objectively see what they're consuming. Um, if someone's gaining weight on a plant-based diet and I'm like, well, what are you eating? Oh, well, I'm just eating salad. Well, you're obviously not just eating lettuce, you know? So I I think it's, and we're all guilty of that. There was a great study. I forget where it was published, but it was such a fantastic study about how our recall is for what we're eating. We're all guilty of it. They took registered dietitians and they had them um, say how many calories they were eating a day, just like offhand versus them tracking it. And they were self-reporting 250 calories less a day than they were actually eating. And it's not because they were being, um, deceptive. It's just because we all just don't, you naturally just cannot remember how much, and you can't even assume how much is in a tablespoon of peanut butter, you know, and serving sizes. So I do think that it's really interesting for, I do this with my patients, regardless, you know, when you're transitioning to a new diet, being able to track things in my fitness pal is very helpful for both the I'm hungry all the time issue. And for the, I'm gaining weight issue, because for the, uh, Actually, this kind of ties into the second question because the second question was it's um, the second question is from Luke and it's I'm too tired. I'm too hungry. Why is that happening? Right. And so this is why I love my fitness pal or chronometer or whatever app you prefer tracking because with similar to problem one, you know, for problem two, they're just eating too little calories. So this is far more common than the weight gain issue, just like you alluded to. Um, a whole food plant-based diet is naturally low in calories, but high in nutrients. So therefore you're just naturally eating less calories just by the nature of eliminating all processed foods and animal products. So like you said, People have to make sure they're eating enough calories filled with whole plant-based foods. And so I do like nutrient and calorie tracking and food tracking, at least for the first, I recommend for my patients for the first two weeks. I actually think this helps with intuitive eating because I think people can see a meal and think, okay, that was really satiating for me. What was in it? Or they could have a day where they feel like 
so hungry and they can realize like, oh my God, that salad was so big. And I thought that I had, you know, 1200 calories today, but I really only had 800 calories. Like that's why I'm so hungry. I, I think it helps because it helps you give you, I'm a physician and I love objective data. And it gives you objective data to analyze, to troubleshoot before you quit the diet completely. There's no reason to quit a diet that you haven't fully given the full evaluation of. So that's that's my uh, my spiel for why I like calorie tracking, at least when transitioning to a new diet. I mean, I think that after a couple of weeks, you'll kind of get in the groove and be able to sense your hunger and stuff like that more. But I do think that it is, it is a helpful tool. Absolutely. I love that app as well. I definitely recommend that one all the time. Which one do you like? Do you like my fitness pal or chronometer? I I only use my fitness pal. Me too. Um, but I've heard great things Same. about that other one. So maybe we should test it out this week and see we how should. we That's like it. That's a good idea. Let's test yeah. it out and download it. I've never tried the other one. I wonder how good they're um, – because I like with my fitness pal that you can scan in like barcode stuff. Right. Super easy. I feel like they have a huge like database. That's our homework this week. That's we'll our homework. We'll let you guys know how well we like it. And and I just I also want to say, Danielle, it's I love what you're doing, by the way, just because I think it's it's so cool because you don't have to be a physician to relate to their journeys. And even yeah. as I was getting these episodes ready for you, like hearing their stories, you know, obviously, you know, being a physician, they can really impact their patients, but the struggles that they have and the questions that they have are no different than all of our questions starting out. And What's really amazing about it is you guys can watch the whole journey and see how they overcome those struggles and the successes. And then you have your community really backing them up with just support and love. And your community is amazing, by the way. Our community. It's our community. (laughs) And also, in in quick plug for Danielle that she did not tell me to do, but if you guys, if, if her podcast has been like bringing you a lot of value and you've been sharing it with your friends and just loving it and you haven't got on iTunes, and written her review, like do the five star review, write something nice. And it's not just to make her happy, which it does. Oh, but thanks, but thanks. the more that you do that, there's an algorithm on iTunes that the more positive reviews and actually typing things out as well, um, is that the more people more people can find her on iTunes. And then that way, she can reach more people help more people. Oh so it's so important. So if you guys just as soon as this episode's done, because there's the stories are amazing, Ugh. you're going to leave so inspired. So before you share it with your friends, go on iTunes if you haven't already, write the review, do the five stars, screenshot it, tag Danielle in because I know she'll share it in her stories. So oh my gosh. go do that. And tag Casey because she'll share it too. Thank you for saying that, Casey. Yeah. That's so nice of you. You guys, I, I appreciate so much that you've all listened to Nutrition Round since the beginning. And it's just been a really fun project. We've reached so many people and we have like some out of this world episodes and interviews coming up with, I mean, like words cannot describe these scientists and physicians that I'm interviewing about everything from happiness to sleep, to heart failure, to women in cardiology to, oh my God, these are my idols. And these are just people that are world renowned experts in their field. And I just can't wait to bring you some more of these interviews. It's really a lot about lifestyle medicine, everything you can imagine. So I, I, I do appreciate that Casey. And, and when you, guys do listen to the episodes. We love when you guys tag us on Instagram. Me and Casey do appreciate, we feel the love and we like to reshare it in our stories. For sure. Tell everyone where they can find you, Case. Yeah. So you can follow me pretty much on every social media. Instagram is mainly where I stay, but uh, it's like home base. (laughs) Instagram's home base. base. Yeah. Home it's base. like millennial home base. That's I need to get on your Twitter I, level though. I've, <laughs> I've, dude, I've, I've ventured into Twitter for everyone listening. That's more on Twitter. I, you know, I'm 32. I'm me and Casey are the same age. We we're we're trying to make our way into the Twitter sphere. I feel like we're it's trying. like a generation above <laughs> us, but I'm trying to break it. I'm trying to break it. Yeah. But, uh, but across the board, um, my social media is just at Dr. Casey Johnson, and it's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. So you can find me there. Shoot me a message and say hey. I love you, Casey. Everyone thank Casey for everything she does. She's like legit the reason why this podcast can happen. She is a true saint. Please follow her on social media because she just brings so much joy to my life by allowing me and helping me to to do this project. And she doesn't get paid anything. So you guys, Wait, you know what? Our, our our tech stream is full of the office memes, so we're we're doing okay. 
We love you guys. And I love you, Casey. And I really hope you guys enjoy this episode. You are going to learn a lot about transitioning to plant-based diet. It's a great episode for you to share with your friends or family that are thinking about it. And like Casey said, just because they're doctors, their situation is so relatable to all of us. Their, their questions, just like you said, you're spot on. Their, their questions and their journey, and a lot of them have kids. Their questions about how do I get my kids to go plant-based or my, you know, my husband won't go plant-based. And they, a lot of, they just all have, how am I going to be plant-based at work? I mean, they have these great questions and, and struggles that are, that anyone and everyone can relate to. So it's really not only a great episode for you, if you're already plant-based, but it's really a great episode, I think, to share with family members that you think could benefit from going plant-based because they can relate to someone else that's starting the experience. For sure. Well, thanks, Casey, for joining. We love you so much. I love you the most. You too. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) All right. Hello, we are with Karen, who is the amazing, wonderful health coach who is going to be helping these doctors transition to plant-based nutrition. And Karen is fantastic. She is the owner of Karen's Healing Kitchen. She has her bachelor's in nursing, and she has been a maternal child health nurse for over 30 years in labor and delivery. And she has also received her training as a health coach from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition's Cutting Edge Health Coach Training Program. She has studied over 100 dietary theories, practical lifestyle management techniques, and innovative coaching methods with some of the world's top health and wellness experts. Karen is unbelievably knowledgeable about plant-based nutrition and how to transition to a plant-based diet, so I'm so excited to have her here. Hey, Karen. Hi, Danielle. We're so glad to have you helping everyone transition to plant-based nutrition. Well, thank you so much for including me in this challenge. I'm really excited. We are so excited to have you. And so, you know, everyone always asks me about the actual practical, you know, starting from step zero. So say if, you know, some of our doctors who are joining this challenge say starting from step zero, they say, I want to go plant-based and I don't know how, and I've never cooked before. Where do we start? (laughs) Okay. So um, what I did was I started first, obviously, in the kitchen. Um, You want to clean out your pantry, go through your pantry. You know, if you have kids, get them involved, read the labels. You know, you want to get rid of anything that anything that you can't pronounce on the back of the ingredients. You know, uh, some people don't maybe not want to get rid of everything. They feel it's wasteful. So if you want to just use everything up and then start anew, that's great too, but you need to take inventory. Um, And also you need to get the family on board and talk to them about it. And let's do this as a family. Um, That usually works out better when you get the whole family involved. That's a great idea. Yeah. So pantry clean out, number one. And it's also a great way to like get rid of all those old, you know, spices and things that are expired because usually you find stuff in the back of your pantry that's been there forever. So it's a, it's a great project. So start there. So now we have maybe have an empty pantry. Now, what do we do? (laughs) (laughs) So um, one of the questions I get all the time or one of the statements I get all the times, excuses, whatever you want to call it is um, it's it's too expensive. Um, You know, I know I can't shop at Whole Foods. Well, you don't need to shop at Whole Foods. You can shop at any grocery store. I love Aldi's. I love Trader Joe's and just good old shop, right? So any, any grocery store is fine. That is such a great point. I, I'm so happy you brought that up because the number one concern people have, and it's a legitimate concern, is about price and um, expense. And I think this is such a great point that um, you don't need to go to Whole Foods in order to go plant-based. And so you just mentioned a lot of different stores that have very, very reasonably priced uh, groceries. Yes. And like I said, one of my favorites is Aldi and Aldi's has great. And even if you want or doing organics, which I do highly recommend that you do as much as you can and can afford to do organics in your fresh produce, but they have great regional prices and your big box stores like Costco's and BJ's are great. And they're adding more and more healthy options to their, to their uh, stores. So, you know, now you have to go shopping. And again, if you have kids, get them involved, bring them to the store with you, you know, show them all the different beautiful colors of the fruits and the vegetables and get them excited about doing this with you. So, you know, some of the staples pantries that you want to load up with is like, you know, your beans. If you want to do dried beans and cooking yourself, that's fine. But you can do canned beans. You know, you want to try and get the low sodium. If you don't get low sodium, then just rinse your beans. It's fine. Brown rice, quinoa, lentils, um, you know, oats, um, raisins, dates, 
nuts, make sure they're raw, seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, sunflower seeds, just, you know, all those basic things that you want to put in your cupboard. And then obviously we want to load up on the fresh fruits and vegetables. But for fruit, for a great idea, especially if they're not in season, is by frozen organic because you can buy big bags for a low cost. And again, these big box stores have great prices on them. But if you don't want to do organics, that's fine too. But you won't go to waste if they're frozen in your freezer and you only use them as you go. Karen, that is such a great tip. That is such a fantastic tip. So say if someone is going trying to save money and they want to go to Costco, um, what are the big bulk items that you can get at Costco to stock your pantry with or your freezer that are healthy on a whole food plant-based diet? Yeah, I personally don't belong to Costco, but I know they do have a lot. I belong to BJ's. So at BJ's- oh, okay. Any of those, any of those yeah, kinds of stores. Any of them. Um, at BJ's, I buy the big bags of frozen blueberries and mixed uh, fruit. And I also buy the big bags of frozen organic broccoli and edanami and spinach and kale. Always have that in the freezer. And then they also have like organic, they have rice and they have quinoa. They have lentils and you can get peanut butter, you know, your, your staple items, like your peanut butter and your almond butters, you want to make sure that there's no added sugar or oils or anything in that. Um, but there's, and, and of course, all your fresh fruits and veggies, they have great prices on, especially your mixed greens. I mean, that big ba- box of uh, mixed greens is like three ninety nine, and that'll last you a whole family for a week. Um, so those are, you know, some of my tips for stocking your pantry. But you also got to have some kitchen tools to get started that makes cooking so much easier. This is everyone's biggest fear. So say if, you know, a lot of people, their biggest concern when they're going plant-based is I don't know how to cook. And everyone thinks they need to be like this Michelin star chef to go vegan. But we both know that is not the case at all. So I would love for you to, to walk through some of the basic, what are some of the basic kitchen tools that we could invest in that will really be a staple and helpful for us to make this transition easy and that we could use for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So my all-time favorite, and I think a lot of us in the plant-based world, is the Vitamix. And I know that's a big purchase, but there are refurbished ones that you can get for half the price. And it's an investment. It really is. They last, you talk to people, they last forever. I have mine now for seven years. I use it every day, pretty much. Um, But if you don't want to go that expensive right away, you can get a, a cheaper version like a Ninja. Um, but my second favorite is the Instant Pot. And some people are afraid of them because they're a pressure cooker. But I... Yeah, do you mind explaining what a, an Instant Pot is? Because I think that even I, before, I don't know, maybe a year ago was the first time I actually started to look at some recipes with the Instant Pot. And I think that some people who aren't very into cooking can find it intimidating, but it's actually incredibly easy to use. Oh, I know. I, I actually was intimidated by it first too. Um, but once you, it comes with this little book, which is amazing. It tells you how to cook everything in there, like all your basics. And that's what I basically, I mean, I, I call it a crock pot on steroids because it basically, <laughs> you know, a crock pot is great, but it takes forever. You know, if you don't remember to put something in it in the morning, it's not going to be there when you come home. So uh, uh, instant pot, like you can make soup in like 15 minutes just by dumping everything that you have from your cupboard and your or your um, freezer in there. But I like to use it for meal preps. Like, you know, for the beginning, if, if you work all week and, you know, we know physicians are working all week and working long hours. So on Sunday, you prep, you put, you make a thing of quinoa, it makes quinoa in five minutes. You do brown rice. So you do all, you make all of your quinoa and stuff like that in an instant pot? Yeah. And it comes out amazing. Oh my gosh. See, I don't even have an instant pot. I'm going to go get one. Oh my guys. gosh. Uh, what's your favorite? I mean, this is not sponsored, but what's your favorite Instant Pot? Because I literally don't have one and you're making it sound like it makes things so easy. Well, I, it's actually called the Instant Pot. That's Oh, it's like actually the brand yeah. is called Instant Pot. Because oh. it's, really it's really a pressure cooker, but Instant Pot has like name is it's just like Kleenex's tissue, you know? Wow. Um, so yeah. So Instant Pot, like I said, that really changed my life. It, it totally... And once people start using it and they're not intimidated by it, everybody has told me the same exact thing. It totally changes your life. Amazing. <laughs> for busy moms or busy physicians and, you know, or, or anybody who just doesn't want to be hours in the kitchen. Like what happens? You can just, essentially, you just load it and like with whatever you want, you don't have to worry about like watching the time or setting anything on fire. No, you, t- you, it, it com- you know, you have to time it and then do natural release, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, 
something like, you know, you can throw something in it real quick and go take a shower and you come back and you have a thing of soup or you have chili, um, you know, or some kind of stew. Yeah. Soups and chilies are really easy to make, especially like in the winter time, they're my favorite things to do, but just, you know, for, I love to put grains in my salad. So I have, and lentils, you make lentils really fast. You make lentil tacos in there. I mean, it, it's endless. And so once I show people, when I work with people one-on-one, this, this is, they're like amazed. They cannot believe it. I'm amazed. I'm literally amazed hearing about it because I know that it's so popular and I've just always like old school, just boiled my lentils or boiled my quinoa, but it would be nice to speed up the process and have it be kind of streamlined and simplified like that. Yeah. And the other thing that you you must have for the Instant Pot is a steamer basket because, if, as you know, steaming is actually better for veggies. It kind of, you know, holds all the nutrients in it rather than like baking or boiling and everything. So a little steamer basket and I like steamed beets, fresh beets, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes. And I mean, my, my favorite thing in the world is just take a sweet potato and stuff it with some quinoa and kale and then put my cheese sauce over it um, or any kind of sauce that you, you know, they make tahini or anything. So, you know, just when you are stocked in your refrigerator of healthy food that you can grab and go, make your lunch with, then you're more apt to stick with eating healthy. You're not going to be tempted to call takeout or, you know, grab something for lunch that's not healthy if you didn't pack your lunch. That is such a great point. That is just such a good point. So everyone out there, you should definitely have a good blender and we should all have an instant pot. <laughs> yeah. And a couple other quick things like um, I, I love my salad chopper. That's like, you know, $6 or something. It's cheap. Um, a good vegetable peeler. Wait, what they, does a salad chopper do? Well, I like to chop my salads. And if anybody follows me and watches my little Instagram stories, um, I dump all my salad into a bowl and then I take the chopper and I chop it. If you ever go to like to a place where they do chop yeah. salad. And personally- Wait, I thought salad, chop salad. I didn't know there was like a- I'm learning so much. I, I love how this podcast is for you guys listening, but I hear I'm like learning all this stuff about kitchen <laughs> tools. I'm, this is like so hilarious. Um, wait, I literally just thought chopped salad was like chopped from people chopping it with a knife. Yeah, there's, like well, a tool. Yeah. there's a tool that actually chops it for you. Yes. Well, I mean, oh my God. It's like I a, a, I'm actually um, under my Instagram story, save stories. I have um, my, like my favorite, uh, staples. And then I'm also going to make a little tab with all my kitchen tools in there. So it'll, it'll be up there. Um, but I, I like, like I said, when you chop your salad, you kind of mix all those flavors in and, and I love yeah. like, it's like, you know, a party in your mouth when you put all those flavors in there together. That's so amazing. Um, yeah. So, so that I have that. And then like I said, a good vegetable peeler. Um, I love my little mini ninja food processor. It costs like 20 bucks and I use it like every day. I use it to make salad dressings. I chop onions, peppers, tomatoes, carrots, and it makes it so much easier than sit there and chop with a knife. So that's a must. Um, and these are inexpensive stuff. Like so an the Ninja chopper. mini chopper. Yeah. Okay, and again, cool. none of this is sponsored. Um, none of this is sponsored, but I honestly, I gotta be honest, like this is so, this info is so resourceful because so many of us don't know. If you Google what kitchen tools do I need, you'll find 5,000 kitchen tools. It is so hard to know what are just the basics that we need to make a bunch of recipes. So that's great. Right. And then I I, I love mason jars. So you buy the... I, get, I love mason jars. Yeah, 16 ounce and 32 ounce and you know 16 ounces for meal prep for doing overnight oats or making yogurt parfaits. The bigger jars, um, I've been doing jar salads and bringing those to work with me. Uh, it's such a great thing. Um, all you just need is a bowl to have it work to dump it in there. But you'd be amazed how much you can put in that jar. Give everyone an example of one overnight oat that you do in your mason jars and then one salad that you bring to work. Yeah. So overnight oats, I just usually whatever veggies, I mean, whatever fruit I have in the freezer, always berries. You know, we always want berries, right? Blueberries or mixed berries, but always blueberries. And then um, I, blueberries aren't that sweet. So I like a little sweet. So I put some mango or, and pineapple in there. Um, and then just your, your regular long grain oats. Um, and then I always add flaxseed, chia seed and cinnamon. And then um, you just keep layering it with those with, you know, whatever you have. And then you top it off with, I use unsweetened soy milk. You can use whatever unsweetened 
plant milky like. Um, I tend to like the soy milk. So that's it. And you put them in the refrigerator and overnight and the next day I bring it to work and I have a nutritious breakfast that's going to keep me full till lunch. Absolutely incredible. Filled with tons of antioxidants and fiber and long acting carbohydrates that are going to give you energy throughout the day. That's amazing. Exactly. You can, you know, mix it up. I, I do like during in the fall, I do pumpkin. I put pumpkin in there, apple, apples and raisins and cinnamon and allspice. It's just, you, there's, you know, endless. And you can do five days at one time on Sunday. Do five, have five for the rest hey, of the this week. This is brilliant. So you can meal prep all of your overnight oats for the week in one day. Exactly. You just want to make sure that your plant milk that you're using is, is you know, is good for the whole week. Okay. You know, some expire, you know, uh, once you open it. So that's my, that would be my only, my only tip for that. And then for salads, basically whatever you have in the house. I mean, I use always use mixed greens with spinach and, you know, all the different greens in there. And then, you know, chop up celery. Uh, I mean, carrots or celery. You can do celery, onions, peppers, uh, cucumbers, carrots. I love fruit in my salad. So I usually put an apple in there or if I have fresh blueberries, I'll put that in there. And then I like to throw the grain in there. So if I've made queen quinoa or brown rice or lentils, whatever, you just, the more the merrier, you know that, the more we can stuff, you know, into our one meal and then put your dressing on the side. You just get these little cups and then make, um, I make oil-free dressings and I do have recipes for them on my, um, in my, on my Instagram page, but they're really easy. Very easy. It's, I said, it just, it just takes getting organized. That's all it is. It's just, and you know, being a nurse, I'm very organized. I'm very type A. So, you know, I went in all in, jumped in and I just make sure that I'm organized. And when I'm organized, I can get things done. That's great. So let's talk then about batch cooking. So tell everyone about how they start getting into batch cooking, what that means and what they can do to essentially prepare food for the week. That's why an Instant Pot is great. If not, you know, you're going to use your your stove. So you boil up some lentils, you boil up some brown rice, um, your quinoa, you know, make some sauces. Like I said, my cheese sauce is great. It's made with just cashews and veggies. Um, you know, you chop up any of your fresh vegetables. Also, too, one of my other favorite kitchen tools is a veggie keeper. Um, I don't know the name of it, but I, all, I will have that also on uh, my page. But it keeps greens fresh. Kale, you know, kale, if you don't use it right away, it just like wilts and it's like gone. Um, it'll keep kale crisp for like 10 days. It's amazing. So that's essential because you don't want to waste food. A lot of people tell me, you know, and they start eating this way and then they waste it because they don't eat it. So you want to keep it fresh as much as possible and then chop it up. Like I said, if you chop up the carrots and you, you also can make like a corned bean salsa and have that ready to go, throw that in your salad. Um, you can do some brown rice noodles, make a peanut sauce up, and you can have a pad thai, you know, one night pad thai, and, uh, you know, have stir fry vegetables cut up, or you can just use frozen. You know, there's nothing wrong with frozen vegetables, especially uh, I like frozen organic vegetables, but any kind of frozen vegetables are fine as long as they have no sauce or anything added to them. They're just plain veggies. Well, um, that sounds good. When I do batch cooking, I pretty much um, on Sunday will cook a ton of quinoa and lentils. Those are my two main staples that I know I'm going to eat throughout the week. Um, and so I'll make enough for the week. Do you have any other things that you'll cook in bulk on Sunday that you are going to plan to use for the rest of the week? Well, I, you know, I do Mexican, so I love to make a um, lentil taco meat, if you want to oh, say. Nice. Yeah, it's basically just lentils and adding taco seasoning and a jar of salsa. Uh, that's it. And then you, you know, you, then you add, you can add your lettuce and your chopped tomatoes and guacamole if you want. Um, also, like I said, that I love making the cheese sauce ahead of time. And then Asian, you know, all the ethnic groups just go through the ethnic and, you know, uh, Italian, I'm Italian. So uh, believe it or not, I do use a jar of tomato sauce, <laughs> but it is a tomato basil with no added oil and it's really good. Um, but I also use zucchini noodles. So uh, you can prepare those also in the week and on the Sunday, you can make a lasagna and have that in the refrigerator. You know, there's just endless, you know, whatever your likes are, uh, you know, people tend to just eat the same thing over and over again. There's, you know, a lot of the learning curve in this process of switching to a plant-based diet is realizing that actually a lot of people end up discovering new vegetables and new fruits when they go vegan because they're 
kind of expanding what they were eating before. One of the things um, that I love so much when you mention pasta is I'm obsessed with the bean pastas. I love lentil pasta. I love chickpea pasta, edamame pasta. And so I pretty much at this point don't even eat regular pasta anymore just because I love the bean pasta so much. They're so filled with fiber and protein and they're just great. Although there is nothing wrong with eating regular whole wheat pasta. That's great too. I just happen to love the bean pasta. And then like you said, uh, zucchini noodles, things like that are great too. Do you use a spiralizer to make that happen? Yes. And you don't need an expensive one. You can go get one at like Rite Aid or CVS, the little spiralizer thing that you stick the zucchini thing in. It's like $9.99. Um, I have an expensive spiralizer and I never use it. Someone had bought it. <laughs> it's from like William Simona or something. It was probably like, I don't know, $50 or something. And it's just too complicated. This thing, I went and bought this thing. And it was like, it was the easiest thing ever. So um, like I said, it doesn't have to be complicated. You'd be amazed. I love zucchini noodles. There's, and you can eat them raw or you can just saute them in like a little bit of um, veggie broth or or um, or water even. And then add whatever you want to it, some tomato sauce or, you know, just chopped vegetables. Um, Amazing. So. So, so with batch cooking, so you mentioned um, when we had discussed that you like to do a bunch of brown rice, quinoa, lentils, and even baked potatoes and sweet potatoes ahead of time for people to be able to quick grab when they're... Um, heading out for work or for dinner throughout the week. Yes. And I also, if you don't have the fresh greens, like I said, the, I have a big thing of, uh, it's quinoa. I mean, it's kale and spinach from uh, BJ's. It's organic kale and spinach. And I just like defrost a little bit of that. And I kept that in the refrigerator. And literally for three days in a row, I ate sweet potato with quinoa and that mixture and the cheese sauce and salsa. And I just, it's, it's just delicious. And it's, like I said, it's, um, most people are creature habit anyway, and they tend to eat the same thing over and over again. And that's how I am. If I make something, I'll just keep eating it, but it's nice to change it up. No, I, I'm someone, I definitely will. I eat a lot of the same things too, but it is nice to switch it up. And, and that actually is a huge barrier to getting people to go plant-based is oftentimes people worry that they're going to eat the same thing over and over again. And what I try to explain to them is you absolutely do not have to, which is why I love, love, love the Forks Over Knives app because they have like a gazillion different recipes that are all oil-free, vegan, and super easy in the app. And this is not sponsored. I'm not affiliated with Forks Over Knives. I just happen to love everything they do because it's all plant-based and it's fully um, oil free and their recipes. When you go on their app, you can pick any recipe and then it makes you a grocery list. It's like so easy and the recipes are super easy to follow. And that's a way to also switch it up and, and try something different. But I do love the idea of convenience wise, you know, making uh, a few staples that you can even integrate into your diet throughout the week. Like for example, like batch cooking, uh, quinoa and or brown rice or lentils, things like that are helpful because even on the Forks Over Knives app, you know, you could pick five recipes for the week that are totally different that all include quinoa so that you only have to make it once. And there's just a few modifications in your ingredients to have five different meals that week. So I think that there's all different kinds of ways to go about this. You can kind of stick with what you like and eat a few things, or you can eat something different every single day for 365 days if you want. There's the options are endless. Absolutely. And I, I, I love having the apps too. Also too, with, like you said, with the quinoa and the brown rice, like just having it as your staple. And then you can have Mexican one night with it. You can have Asian one night with it. Um, you can, you know, do Italian one night. So just switch it up and uh, you can also just take your, you know, whatever you like your favorite recipes and just plant based them <laughs> or veganize them. Um, you know, if it's meat, you use lentils. They're very meaty. Yeah. Well, I can't, I can't let you go without asking you to give everyone your cheese sauce recipe because it is so good. And if you uh, have downloaded my plant-based guide, it's on there. And um, at the end of our interview, I'll give everyone your uh, information so they can find you on social media and look through all your different recipes on your stories, but give everyone little, a little preview into your cheese recipe because it is so good. So, um, what I did was I just, you know, when I first transitioned, I just went on Pinterest and just tried recipes over and over again. I tried several different cheese sauces and then I just kind of made it my own. So it's, you know, I didn't originate the original from it, but I did make it, I mixed it up. So it's made with one large carrot, two yellow potatoes, a quarter of an onion, half a cup of cashews, some little bit of salt, onion powder, garlic powder, Dijon mustard, 
nutritional yeast, a little bit of squeeze of lemon. And if you want it for like a queso or for hot, you just add a little hot sauce. And you're just going to boil those veggies and you throw it in the Vitamix or high speed blender with some hot water and all the spices and you have cheese sauce. And you can either make with mac and cheese. Um, I always throw broccoli or kale in my mac and cheese to up the ante or spinach or peas. Um, or you can use it over for Mexican. So, and I store it in like a mason jar and keep it for the week. It'll keep for a whole week. Uh, it's just so great. And storing in a mason jar is uh, exactly what I do. I think it makes it it's so easy. And I store so much in mason jars. What are your favorite buys from uh, Trader Joe's? I will admit that I am a Whole Foods customer because I just am, it's what's closest to us. And I love Whole Foods. But if Trader Joe's was close to me, I would go to Trader Joe's. And I've just heard there's so many great finds there for vegans now. So what do you love getting at Trader Joe's? Yeah, I mean, and they're also very reasonable in price. So I love, I love their brown rice pasta. That is actually one of my favorites. And uh, I like their tomato uh, sauce. It's a mushroom tomato. It's, it's fat free, has no oil in it. And just all their frozen, they have great a variety of frozen organic veggies and fruit. Their beans are great price. Um, they also have nutritional yeast now. I, I like their almond butter you can buy with or without salt. Um, they, it's just almonds. And, um, you know, their fresh fruit and vegetables are all also pretty good. They have a low sugar coconut granola that I like. I usually don't buy stuff with added sugar, but this really has very teeny bit and I use very little of it. And I usually mix it with my own oats and you can get organic oats there. There's just so much. So the other thing that um, everyone should also try to keep in mind, depending on where you live, you know, now that it's summer, trying to eat local can always be very helpful because um, if you have any farmer's markets near you, if um, any of the fruits and vegetables are growing locally, try to eat local. Um, it helps to definitely save money and also eating seasonal and local is one of my favorite things. So I try to stick with that too. And it definitely helps to uh, save money for sure. And it's just an easy way to switch up what fruits and vegetables you're eating during the season. Totally agree with you. You know, we're in, we're in, um, I'm in New Jersey. So, you know, it's a garden state. So there's literally farm stands all around me. So I do eat local in the summer. And also you can join a CSA, which is a community supported agriculture, where you can get it delivered freshly to your door once a week or pick up. So those are great options. That is such a great point about CSA. I think CSAs are definitely underutilized. Um, and I think they are just such a good idea. Yeah. And there's so many there just just Google CSA in your area and you will probably find one. That is such a great idea. Well, um, the last thing I wanted to touch on with you is when you are coaching someone that is going plant based and they're worried about going out to dinner or going to a party or going to someone's house for meals, what is your best tips for people that are looking to either eat out or eat at a party or a wedding or anything, any sort of event that they're going to and they're switching to a plant based diet? Okay, if it's an event where you're, you're invited and it's a formal invitation where you can respond, um, if there's not an option for a vegan option to check off, just write a little note on there. Can I please have the vegan option? And then when you get to the place, just go over to the maitre d' and just, you know, say, hey, you know, is it possible? I ask for a vegan option. And I've never had an issue. So they're usually very accommodating. So that to me is an easy one. When you go out to dinner with friends, just know where you're going ahead of time. And I always pull up the menu, look what I'm going to have available so I'm not caught off guard when I get there. And then a lot of times I just pull things from different um, entrees. And if you're really nice to the waiter, they're usually very accommodating. You know, sometimes they have to go back and forth and ask like five times, does this have <laughs> milk in it? Is, you know, it's a cheese, whatever. But I will make a meal out of sides. You know, I'll order the baked potato and maybe some steamed broccoli or whatever. But that to me, it's it's not an issue anymore. And then go into a friend's house, maybe talk to the hostess ahead of time and ask maybe if you can bring a dish and bring something that's extremely delicious that's going to blow everybody away and they'll probably be the first one the first dish to, to be gone that's usually my biggest complaint from my plant-based friends they say I bring my plant-based dish and everybody eats it <laughs> so <laughs> um, you know, it's a great way to introduce your diet to someone also without like being pushy and then also you know you can always eat before you go to be safe and always have like a little snack in your pocketbook. Um, but I would talk, I definitely talk to the hostess because you don't want to feel rude by not eating their food. 
you know, which some people will get offended by. So if you just talk to them ahead of time, if it's a close friend, I'm sure it's not going to be a problem if it's, you know, your spouse's boss's house or something. <laughs> it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but there's usually something you can find, some fresh veggies that are out or some hummus or something, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. And I actually think that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that touch on this and Char Nolan is actually, she's a plant-based chef in the Philadelphia area. She always has a great uh, tip is for steakhouses. This is brilliant. She says, if you go to a steakhouse, you can actually just get, you know, get the baked potato, obviously no butter, no oil or anything like that, and get the sides of vegetables. And you can make actually a really fantastic meal that's really hearty with a baked potato and the vegetables that are steamed without any added oil or, you know, added salt. You can just put some pepper on it and get some garlic and even some balsamic on it. And it can be really delicious because, you know, a steakhouse is a place where you think you're not gonna be able to find anything, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, additionally, I want to give a shout out to Melissa Wood Tappenberg, a friend of mine. She is on Instagram at, at Melissa Wood Health. She's constantly um, posting how she veganizes things at different restaurants. She lives in New York City. Um, and she will, uh, one of the, my favorites that she'll do is she'll get a pasta and it, she'll have, you know, just a pasta with tomato sauce at a restaurant that will just have tons of beautiful vegetables in it. It'll be a non-vegan restaurant and it looks so good. And it's something I used to never think of ordering until I saw her doing it. It'd be just like this beautiful pasta with fresh tomatoes, spinach, mushrooms, eggplant, onion, you know, everything you can imagine. It just looks fantastic. And, you know, it's always easy to veganize a pizza because, you know, vegan cheese, you know, that you can buy in the store is not necessarily very healthful. So, you know, even if you wanted to just eat a healthy version of a vegan pizza, if you can get whole wheat dough, that's great. And then also you can just get, you don't even need cheese on it. You can literally just get you know, red sauce, and then just throw a ton of vegetables on it. And it just tastes so great. And it's so filling. Yeah. And I guess I, I do the same thing when I'm at Italian restaurant with pasta, I just ask for all the veggies that they have in steam. And I usually come out with this beautiful dish. It's, you know, it's really surprising how like so many restaurants and so many places they are so accommodating now. They are. And a lot of times what comes out for me, everybody's like envious. They're like, Oh, man, I want that. <laughs> So true. It's so yeah. true. And one big thing for pizza, I love throwing mixed greens on top of all those veggies yes. and then drizzle with some balsamic vinegar. And it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. That sounds so good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the tricks for people also switching to a plant based diet, I think that should be noted is to check labels, like you mentioned. And, and one of the other issues is that even when you're at a restaurant and there's bread, you may think that that's vegan, but it could be made with butter on it. It could have egg in it. So just, you know, you are not strange to ask the waiter if this is, um, you know, dairy egg free, um, you know, and as plant-based nutrition and veganism is coming more and more to the forefront, people don't think we're crazy for asking that, especially with, I mean, lactose intolerance, to ask for things that are dairy free is, is actually a medical necessity for many of us. So it's totally reasonable. And I think it's fully possible to not give up your social life and go vegan. Absolutely. And one just quick thing about that with the bread, because that just reminded me of something, know what your triggers are. And white flour for me is a really big trigger. Like I could eat a whole basket of bread. So but I don't because I, I know what it's going to do to me. So a lot of if you don't even want it, just ask the waiter to take it away. And then it's not like a temptation for you because there's still some people still have some triggers that they have to deal with. Um, so and the same thing with your house, just whatever you know is your trigger. Don't have it in the house. <laughs> don't bring it home. Um, you know, you're less likely to binge on it if you've had a stressful day or you're tired or, you know, you're really hungry. That is such a fantastic point. That is a great, great, great point. Because if it's not there, you're not going to be worried about it. And that's a really great point about even having the waiter take it away. That being said, what's your favorite bread, actually? What's your go to bread that's really healthy that you think could help add to a plant based diet? Yeah, well, you know, I think everybody knows about the Ezekiel bread, um, which mm -hmm. is great. I love Ezekiel. That's what I yeah. use. Yeah. 
Aldi's has a organic uh, multi-grain bread that I buy also, but I don't use that much bread. I still have some issues sometimes with eating too much processed products. So because I had a lot of GI problems in the file. So I eat it sparingly, but my I do buy it for my family, the whole grain, the whole grain bread from Aldi's or the Ezekiel or Dave's Killer is usually the the three ones Dave's that we use. Dave's Killer is one that I've heard lots of people love. I eat Ezekiel bread probably every single day. I love Ezekiel bread. Um, I think it's so great, but I have to try Dave's Killer bread because everyone has so many great things to say about it. I want to give it a try. Yeah. And Trader Joe's actually has a bread too. That's pretty good. It's a, um, uh, it's a whole grain bread. It's their brand. That's pretty good also. So those are the ones that I, that I usually use. I'm sure there's more out there, but there's any ones that I've experienced. And just to go over, I mean, you guys have heard us talk about our favorite resources and things like this, but I, uh, just to go over some of our favorite um, recipe sites and things like that, that people can um, look on. So I love the Forks Over Knives app, which I mentioned. And again, I'm going to say I'm not sponsored by them. Um, maybe I should be if Brian Wendell's listening. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Brian's my friend. He's the president of Forks Over Knives. But I, they don't pay me to say this. I just literally use their app every single day. So I can't even lie. I love it so much. You go to the, uh, you go to the app store um, and you just download it and you can get all the recipes you can imagine like desserts breakfast lunch dinner everything and like there's like a gazillion and it's so easy and i think it's available on every app store no matter what phone you have um i also love uh of course um physicians committee has a ton of recipes and great great resources who else do you love um i love kathy fisher straight up food um she's wonderful everything has no oil no added sugars is it a website or what is that yeah, straight up food. Dot com. Yeah. Okay, great. And then um, she actually works out at um uh, with um, I think she used to work with Clap Dr. Clapper out there and doing some cooking classes. Um, so I also love um the Engine Two group. Yeah. So everything that the Esselstons do, the Engine Two um cookbooks and things like that are are really great. And and um. Anne and Jane Esselstyn, they have great recipes and they have a YouTube channel that's hysterical. So if you really want to laugh while you're cooking, just look up their videos. <laughs> They're really funny. Um, and I also love the Vegan 8. She, everything is eight ingredients or under. There are so many great resources. I did not mention them all, but uh, oh, I cannot forget to say Rich Roll, who I love dearly, who's been on the podcast. He has recipes. He has a plant-powered program. Just go to Rich Roll's website, and I love everything that him and his wife are doing. They have so many great plant recipes. They have dietary plans, and just it's outstanding. And shout out to Rich for everything he does. And I mean, there are so many. I, I'm not purposely leaving anyone out. Um, I list all my favorites on my website. If you go to the veggiemd.com, I have a plant-based transition guide. And on there is listed the vitamins you need when you go plant-based. Um, it's listed different um, interesting information about why you should go plant-based health-wise, although you guys probably already know that from listening to the podcast. And additionally, it lists all my favorite resources. There's a ton of great plant-based starter guides out there. I have one that's on my website. PCRM has one. Plantrition has one. These plant-based starter guides are out there. They're amazing. And Karen, tell everyone where they can find you. So I'm the most active on Instagram. So it's Karen's Healing Kitchen. And then I also have a website under the same name, karenshealingkitchen.com. And I'm also on Facebook. Um, and you guys, it's super important. Follow Karen on Instagram this month because she is going to be sharing a lot of the recipes, these kitchen tools, the things we've discussed in her Instagram stories. So you're going to be able to see what she's mentioned and you're going to be able to actually see what she's gone through with the doctors that we are coaching for this plant-based uh, transformation because this is the information she's provided them in one-on-one -on -one coaching and more. And a lot of that is accessible in her stories. So follow her at Karen's Healing Kitchen. Thank you so much, Karen, for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. And really looking forward to this adventure. Yeah, the doctors are going to do great. Okay, well, stay tuned to listen to the interviews with all five of the physicians who are going from omnivore to vegan starting tomorrow. And we are here with Dr. Samantha Jones. And I want to introduce this wonderful doctor to all of you. Hi, Dr. Jones. Hi, everyone. 
So Dr. Jones, tell everyone all about you, uh, what kind of physician you are, and just about you from a medical perspective first. And then we want to hear about, you know, everything that motivated you to join this challenge. You got it. Well, I'm an Orlin Maxlow facial surgeon. I've been out of residency for about four years now, and I practice in Santa Barbara. Uh, recently, I moved up to the San Inez Valley, which is just north of Santa Barbara. And yeah, my I work in private practice, so usually my day consists of extracting teeth, bone grafting, dental implants, and I also take facial trauma call at our local hospital as well. That's awesome. So you're busy, needless to say. <laughs> yes. So what brought you to being interested in doing this challenge? Because clearly you're an omnivore and I am super mm -hmm. excited that you're excited to, you know, jump into plant-based nutrition and, and what kind of got you interested in this? Yeah, well, a few different things. Um, first of all, I saw Forks Over Knives ages ago and I've always thought, and from what I've read, it just seems like common sense. Like this is the, the way that we should eat just to truly make our bodies the best that they can be. And I always thought that, but I've never felt like I could do it. So I never even kind of entertained the idea of even going vegetarian or anything like that. But the more and more studies I read, as well as listening to your podcast and whatnot, the evidence is there. Like I'm completely convinced, but I never felt like personally I could actually do it. And then when this challenge came up, I was like, hey, why don't I give it a go and go for it? And not just for health reasons, but more and more, I've also been convinced just for animal rights purposes, as well as I want to do my little part for the environment. And yeah, that's kind of overall why I want to try this out. And I'm excited. That is so awesome. I'm so excited. I mean, I'm just so pumped to see <laughs> all of you get ready and go through this challenge. And that being said, you know, so I've um, mentioned this on the podcast before I started a plant based preventive cardiology clinic. And so I've actually transitioned over 100 patients to a fully vegan diet. And so I've been able to actually witness firsthand from a medical standpoint, you know, with my patients in close proximity, what kind of hurdles because you know, some people jump into plant based nutrition, and they're like, this is super easy. And some others, sometimes my patient comes for follow up, and they're like, oh, I've just been eating salads for, you know, four straight weeks and mm -hmm. I'm getting so sick of it. So what do you think, do you think are going to be the biggest hurdles for you? Okay. One off the bat treats. I love my little desserts. So that's like one thing that's really hard to, hard to give up. I definitely eat a lot of dairy. So that's what I'm sort of most, most afraid of, <laughs> but gotcha. So I, I gotta be honest, the treat thing, I feel you cause I have like a major sweet tooth big time. And one of the things I've learned, so uh, one of the recipe resources that um, Karen and I had suggested is Forks Over Knives. They have like amazing whole food plant-based desserts that are so good and you don't even need dairy. But I do hear that about dairy too. A lot of people sometimes, that was actually my biggest same thing. I, I actually was vegetarian first for a while before I went vegan. Do you have like a favorite thing in dairy that you're most nervous to give up? Well, I don't even eat it that much, but I do love good old whipped cream and ice cream. <laughs> That's probably my freaking favorite thing. Um, and then cheese. <laughs> cheese is another one. I love cheese. So those will probably be the two things that I'm sad to see go, but I know that there's other options and I think my life will be complete without them. <laughs> so. Well, you know what is so crazy is that um, just wait till you try some of the recipes the plant-based mac and cheeses that are made with cashew cheese and no oil are so good. Like they really just hit the spot. They're so healthy and like they just taste great. Like it really does because uh, I used to love cheese. Um, and then the different plant-based options are just, they're so amazing. The whipped cream, I am sure there is someone out there. If you are listening, you know a way to make a healthy <laughs> vegan whipped cream. Please find Samantha. What's your IG again? Samantita23. Find Sam on Instagram and message her your recipe. I am, you know, we are depending on you guys, the listeners who are vegan and who are so helpful with supporting one another to help support these doctors go plant-based because I do not have all the answers. And between all of us, the thousands of you out there that have been plant-based for so long, we can, we can find some solutions. So I think that the dairy um, issue, a lot of people feel that way. And I find that so many of the vegan alternatives are just so great 
Um, you know, the issue is with the plant-based cheeses that are like the actual cheeses that you buy pre-made in the store. Some of them, you know, I say some of them are, are very filled with like fat and coconut oil, which is, you know, mm -hmm. not great. I still think that things like tree line or uh, Miokinos, those are better than the dairy alternatives. I mean, the dairy itself, like the actual dairy, but I do say limited basis. Mm -hmm. I do think that the versions that are made through Forks Over Knives, like if you check out, and um, Karen's going to give you a great recipe for vegan mac and cheese, you can make it so healthy with no added oil, with cashews, nutritional yeast. There's just so many great healthy ways to make plant-based cheese. And so what about your husband? So living with someone that's not plant-based, sometimes uh, people get nervous about that. Yeah, no, thankfully he is super supportive and he has an interesting background where um, he grew up Seventh-day Adventist. So he has <gasps> several family members who are, are strict vegetarians and, you know, his grandparents lived well into their 90s in wow. very good health. So so he's he's seen the proof and knows that it's, you know, that it, this, this is the way to be. Um, he has gone away from the vegetarianism as an adult, but he's completely willing to, to go and help out with me because he does a lot of the cooking. I thought once I was done with residency, yeah, I yeah. would like have this newfound love of cooking, but <laughs> I realized what it was like for me it was truly like putting on scrubs every day and clogs. I love that. I never have to yeah. think about my clothes. And during residency, I never had to think about food because I had the cafeteria and didn't have to prepare anything for myself. But what I've found since I've been out, there's no love of cooking for me. Yeah, so I, am, so I hear you. <laughs> it's going to definitely be helping me and doing some meal prep. And th that's kind of the biggest hurdle I actually feel like I want to get over, which is actually preparing some of my own food, which I right. feel like it's time for me to do. I'm an adult no, now. I, I like, <laughs> no, listen, I totally hear you. I am not someone that like loves cooking either. But you know what? There are so many fast ways to... Like some days I get home from being on call and I'm like exhausted. I'll just make like a quick, you know, I'll just put lentils and quinoa that I've already made like maybe a couple days ago with, you know, a bunch of different veggies in a bowl and with tahini and some lemon and eat it. And it's like amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it, the thing is, I think about going plant-based, especially with a lot of support from social media and from Karen and I is that, you know, the one of the best things is that you really see what's out there, you kind of open your eyes to all these new, really uh, easy to make vegetables and new tips and tricks. Like one of the tricks I always tell everyone is that roasting vegetables with parchment paper makes them so crispy hmm. um, and you don't need any oil. Same as using um, obviously an air fryer. That's like the air fryers are like the bomb because you can, uh, you can crisp anything with no oil and no fat added to it. Um, so we crisp Brussels sprouts or anything like that. But there's so many tips and tricks that you'll learn. And then you'll be like, oh my God, this is so easy. But I, I understand. I get you. Like I, that's why I always try to tell my patients too, that you, know, you don't need to be a culinary expert to go plant-based because if you think about it, I mean, I can't even, I don't even know how to cook a steak or, um, or how to make chicken. I probably mess it up. So I, I feel like uh, it's, it's actually not too hard. And luckily, you can't really get food poisoning that easily this way. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so um, how about with regards to one of the other things I found um, being a doctor, and I was going to ask all of you, is that, you know, you guys are so busy. So during the day, are you um, like, what's your go to during the day usually? Yeah, that's a good point. I am guilty of skipping lots of lunches um, just because I get you know, get into the day and I'm not really that hungry. So now I, I, I do want to be a little bit better about eating more regularly. I mean, what I usually would do for lunch if I didn't prepare anything, which is pretty much always I'd like run to Starbucks and get those egg, egg white bites or you know something like that quick. Um, so I think it's going to be a big change for me to actually kind of start chopping up some veggies and I and, and bringing it to work, which is going to be good. Really good. Yeah, that'll be great. And I totally am a huge supporter of where um, I am not like someone that says, 
you need to eat like 17 times a day, every three hours or whatever. I, I myself intermittent love intermittent fasting. Um, and I just, I am so a believer in do what your body feels. So some days, Mm. you know, I'll wake up and be like, I need to eat breakfast today and I'll have a smoothie or overnight oats or something like that. And some days I'm not hungry and I go the entire day in the cath lab or in a procedure and I haven't eaten and I feel fine. So I think that listening to your body is most important and not, I I never want anyone to, you know, feel like they have to force lunch down or anything like that. Just intuitively eat, eat when you're hungry. And I find that um, one of the biggest uh, issues people find in a plant-based diet often is that they are getting so much more full regularly because you're eating so much fiber. Interesting. Yeah. So that's something to keep tuned to. And then um, as you increase the fiber, one of the other things that we always tell everyone to, you know, just be aware of is that if you get any abdominal discomfort or anything like that, obviously let me know and we'll talk you through it because sometimes there's certain tricks of certain vegetables to add in in different uh, ways in order to maximize the um, adding fiber into your diet in a way that won't give you an AGI upset. Okay, great. I will definitely remember that. (laughs) So, um, all right. Well, we're so excited to have you tell everyone where they can find you on Instagram and Twitter. That way they can support you. And um, Dr. Jones is going to be, anytime she has a question for about plant-based nutrition or needs an idea, I told her she should post it in her stories and we need your guys' help to support her along the way. So where can they all find you on social media? Okay, on Instagram, I'm at Samantita23. And then on Twitter, I am at, I think it's Dr. Sammy B. Jones. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I'm looking forward to doing this together. All right. (laughs) Take care. Thank you. All right. And next up, we are with Dr. David Berman, who is a heart failure and transplant cardiologist in Michigan. And I am so honored and excited to have David on. So Dr. Furman, thank you for coming on the podcast and thank you for joining this challenge. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to the challenge and the opportunity. All right. Well, why don't you tell everyone listening about what kind of physician you are, what kind of patients you see, and a little bit about your medical background. Sure. So I'm a a cardiologist. I'm practicing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the west side of the state at Spectrum Health. And I specialize in advanced heart failure and transplant. I've been in practice for about six years now. And I I exclusively see patients with uh, late stages of heart failure uh, and who may need advanced heart failure treatments like uh, LVADs, which are heart pumps or heart transplants. So I see that far end of the, the spectrum of heart disease primarily. Wow. So I um, obviously am in my last year of cardiology fellowship. So I'm very familiar with this. And for anyone listening, the heart failure doctors are like the he monk doctors of cardiology, (laughs) because you guys are just so I give you so much credit. It's a tough space to be in the amount that's changing and the technology that's advancing and how well people are doing the transplant is so promising. But at the same time, it's still tough to see patients, you know, in that stage. And so I just, I give you so much credit. Thank you for doing what you do. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's amazingly, can be, can be amazingly stressful, but it, it's amazingly rewarding and I wouldn't, wouldn't be doing anything else. Unbelievable. It's, I, I can imagine, especially in your field in transplant, it's so rewarding because when you see patients, you know, I feel like as a resident, especially when we were rotating on the transplant service and things like that, I would, you know, we see the inpatient part. So we see people when they're sick. And I remember every transplant cardiologist I've ever worked with is like, you got to come to the outpatient clinic and see them when they're 10 years post transplant, they're doing amazing. And those are the things that I think are so I, I can imagine are unbelievably rewarding for you. So, um, so tell us a little bit about what's made you interested in going plant-based and joining this challenge. So, yeah, a few things. It really comes down to, um, you know, recognizing at this age, you know, which I won't exactly reveal, (laughs) um, you become cognizant of, you know, certain things about your health and that, you know, you really need to be, um, you know, paying closer attention to your health for the long term. And, you know, especially for, my family too. Um, you know, I, I have a wife and three children, ages eight through thirteen. Um, not only do I want to be around for them, but uh, you know, I also want to model good health habits for them as well. Um, so that was really the, I mean, the root of of why I want to do this. 
Um, I also have, uh, it appears, some unfavorable uh, genes from my dad's side. My uncles and my dad, you know, Filipino men who, they're not overweight, but they have all of the uh, the, the cardiac risk factors, unfortunately. And and I think, I feel like I'm kind of teetering on that brink. Um, and, and so I really feel like I, I need to do something to kind of take control of that. Yeah, well, I give you so much credit because, you know, as doctors, I think that in general, we're so focused on caring for our patients. It's hard to focus on your own health because you are just going, going, going. And I think, you know, We know nutrition is so important in preventative medicine and things like that, but it it can be just hard to kind of figure out what the right way is to go about it. And I am so excited that I have you and also Mo, who is another one joining the challenge, she's a cardiology fellow, but to have two cardiologists join the challenge, I, I can't say that I didn't specifically select for that because I did. I really wanted I really wanted to reach the cardiologist because I think this is so great because you know one of the questions I've been asking everyone is on a day-to-day basis when you see patients in general, you know, how many would you say, how much percentage would you say with heart disease? And I, I already kind of know the answer to this, but how much do you think we can prevent with lifestyle modification? I think, uh, you know, see, being an advanced heart failure cardiologist, I see the, the far end of the spectrum, you know, so I look back and I say, where can this be prevented or what can we do from this point to reverse some of this? I would say, you know, so at least on the order of 50% uh, um, could be uh, reversed or significantly impacted uh, by, uh, you know, say a plant-based diet. I, uh, I actually, I should put a plug in. I, I have a little bit of a head start on this because we have um, you being a cardiology fellow and having another cardiology fellow on here. Our um, cardiology fellowship uh, has started a sort of an innovative culinary medicine program. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, so I should plug, yeah. Doc, so Dr. Christy Arts, um, she's an internist and she's worked with some of the, the dietitians as well. And Dr. Tom Boyden. Uh, one of our preventive cardiologists um, were instrumental in making this part of the required curriculum for our fellows um, wow. and, and now the residents and they're big plant-based proponents. So I started wow. learning about it. Yeah, I started learning about it from them um, and had tried to, you know, slowly implement some of it. But, you know, yeah. your cha- your challenge is, a, is like a discreet, you know, sort of way for me to say, okay, like I, I'm going to do this now. <laughs> oh, Dr. And, Foreman, and, the uh, second yeah. you make that, uh, the second you make that Instagram p- public, you will not be able to hide. The <laughs> right, vegans right. on social media will be encouraging you for 10 weeks. You won't be able to get rid of us. Um, yeah. That is so unreal. I'm literally like mind blown. I'm going to have to talk to you about this more uh, another time. I cannot believe yeah. there's a culinary medicine program for your fellows. That is beautiful. That is like so fantastic. I think everyone listening right now is like, Oh my God. I think I've been talking about that this entire season and the previous season of my podcast, how much this is needed and for fellows and residents. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So props to your program and for everyone getting ahead of the game. And I think that's so great. And I think that it's just so uh, wonderful to see a lot of physicians kind of, um, I had David Katz on who, um, I'm not sure if you know, but he's really, really, he's well-known nutrition um, expert. He's a physician at Yale and he mm-hmm. does some of the world's most renowned uh, research. And I just had him on for an interview and we discussed how, you know, he goes through the research and the data and and, uh, some physicians will ask, well, you know, how do we know what is the best diet for us? And David Katz was like, there is no confusion out there that, you know, it's, it's that people don't know the literature, but we know that at least a plant predominant diet, even if you don't go hundred percent plant-based, but a plant predominant diet is going to be the most healthful. We know that from everything ranging from in vivo studies all the way up to epidemiological studies and meta-analysis. So I think that it's great to have doctors join this uh, podcast and join this challenge because I think that everyone getting to see this experience through your eyes and you're all in um, different specialties will be quite interesting. So uh, my question for you is, what do you think your biggest barrier to going plant-based this summer, what do you think the biggest hurdle for you will be? Mm, I think uh, the, the biggest hurdle probably is time, I guess. That that would be a big hurdle, um, followed by um, you know the the dynamics of family with kids of different different ages and Absolutely. dietary preferences and and everything. 
uh, I'd say those those are the the two biggest challenges. And that's like absolutely reasonable. Um, yeah. And and super, it's time is is one of the things where um, you'll hear in the beginning of the episode, and Karen will continue to work with you too. Is that there are so many time saving ways to make it healthy, but in general, I think time is definitely the big barrier people find to sticking with it just because hospital cafeterias aren't necessarily the most helpful. But now you, now that I know you have this culinary program, you have no excuse. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) that's right. And what are you looking forward to most about uh, trying plant-based diet? I'm looking forward to, you know, just seeing, uh, you know, if I feel better and then, you know, if, if there, you know, if there are more quantitative changes in my health, um, you know, just going back, um, you know, after the, my first really stressful couple of years in my practice, I had gained some weight. Um, and then so my, my, my wife and I, we just kind of did a, you know, one of these popular sort of meal replacement type programs. And, uh, and it was, I mean, it was extremely effective at losing the weight and I've kept it off, but I was kind of surprised that being, you know, being at a healthy weight, uh, that I still had kind of borderline blood pressure, um, cholesterol, um, and all of that. And, um, uh, you know, I suspect that the plant-based diet is probably going to help me with that. Absolutely. And I, I think that we can say as someone that's incredibly dedicated and involved in this, I, the reason why it's so I just believe in it so much. is isn't just the papers I read. It's that, so I started a plant-based preventive cardiology clinic as a fellow, my first year of fellowship. I was very fortunate that my program allowed me to do so and saw patients every Tuesday that sought me out to go plant-based. So I've uh, watched um, like 150 patients evolve into plant-based nutrition over the past two years. And I've been able to, I've submitted cases to AHA, to multiple different conferences of these patients that I mean, I'm running into the problem now where I have so many patients that when they first saw me, they had a fib with the chads to vask of say three. And then all of a the sudden they've lost 60 pounds. They are no longer diabetic. Their hemoglobin A1C goes from 13 to five. They are no longer hypertensive. They're off all their hypertension medications. And now they're a super active 55 year old who's super fit, wants to go mountain biking, do I have to stay on my eloquence? And we're like, this has never been studied before. So it's just interesting because I'm seeing patients do so well that I'm actually developing this new panel of patients that I'm looking to study because it's it's really fascinating. You know, what do you do when people just reverse a lot of the chronic disease that we're so used to just treating forever? And so I've been able to see so unbelievably like in my face week to week um, you know, my, my attending that's agreed to supervise my clinic is an interventionist who does all of our hospitals ECMO. And so the fact that I've gotten him convinced really has people like mind blown because he's like, oh yeah, like the plants work. Like, I mean, every week we're taking our patients off of medications and every week we're seeing, you know, so many different cases improve. And one particular case I wanted to mention on this episode that um, was fascinating. And I think you would find interesting, you know, I've seen a lot of patients I have, with systolic heart failure, where their heart failure has improved on a plant-based diet, in in addition to guideline-directed medical therapy, and some in the setting of revascularization. So you could say it's from being revascularized. Some in the setting of, um, you know, they were in a tachy-mediated cardiomyopathy, so their EF had dropped. Well, just recently, I had a rung of patients who had known systolic heart failure for years. I had one patient in particular, two years, known systolic heart failure, had already been revascularized, had already been on optimal um, GDMT. Comes to see me, switches from a full standard American diet to a whole food plant-based diet. It was the only change. I mean, he's a patient that's already been optimized. He already has CRT, everything. Well, his EF went from 25 to last month. I got a stress echo. It's now uh, 45. Wow. So, I mean... I see these, I, and I, you know, I, of course, I am a fellow and I am, I work with a ton of omnivores. So I'm constantly trying to prevent, uh, present the, the data and the science in the most, you know, non biased way possible. And this was it for me because I was like, guys, I mean, I submitted this case to AJ because I was like, the, you guys, this is just outstanding. You know, he's already been revascularized for years. And the only variable that had changed was diet. And so I, actually, there's a paper that I'm working on with a lot. I'm on the ACC nutrition work group. And there's a paper I'm working on this summer with uh, Dr. Rob Osfeld, Kim Williams, a few others on erectile dysfunction and plant-based nutrition. Um, And so I think there's a lot of really great 
data and stuff that's coming out now that is really convincing. And I think in our field, I think it's so applicable, you know, it's just so, and it's so rewarding. I love seeing my patients go off their diabetes medications, take off all their antihypertensives and just do so well. And it, and it's, it's just really wonderful. So I'm excited for you to, to jump in. Yeah. Con- congratulations. That's a, an amazing, uh, you know, patient experience that you've had uh, for Thank being a you. fellow and, um, you know, hopefully you can continue that and, you know, and publish out of that. That's a really great achievement. I hope so. I'm, I'm also uh, with my, with this population of Chad's to vask patients, like all these patients who just do so well, it's almost like every time they see me, I'm like, you guys are doing too well. You're just, it's too, you're doing too good. <laughs> every time they see me, I, I have this, I told you this whole population where I'm like, do we anticoagulate them? Do we not? So now I've actually started to send them for loops because hmm. It's, you know, I've discussed this with multiple electrophysiologists from all over. And the question is, is, you know, just because your, your markers come down, so your, your hypertension's gone or your hemoglobin C is technically normalized, is it truly gone? How much is there an AFib risk? So now what I'm doing is I'm putting loops in these patients who've CHADS2 VASC has gone from three to zero. They don't want to be in anticoagulation anymore. They're super healthy. I put a loop in them, we take them off AC, and we watch them. And I'm hoping to get a paper out of that. We'll see. <laughs> great. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. But, you know, and nutrition's powerful. And so I, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, tout it too much. But I do think that in our field, especially in cardiology, we can see it help a lot. So I'm super excited to have you along. And I want you to plug yourself. So everyone, because, you know, let me tell you something, social media, everyone loves to share information. They love to follow along on your journey. Where can everyone follow you? Uh, so I'm on um, Twitter mostly in, in terms of my sort of medical presence. Uh, that's at David Furman, MD. And uh, I, I do have an Instagram account, but I've never used it. But I have a feeling that I will be. <laughs> you are absolutely. You probably have, no joke, at least a thousand friend requests in your inbox right now because <laughs> I, you, my stories and my messages I've been getting all day has been like about how people are trying to follow you. You got to talk to Dr. Furman. I'm like, I know because uh, that's where a lot of the action happens on Instagram. So yeah. So, well, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing more about everything and Karen will check in with you and thanks for joining. We're excited to see how this goes. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm excited. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. All right, everyone. Next up, we are interviewing Dr. Good Arzi. And Heidi is an absolutely wonderful physician. She's a dermatologist, and I'm so excited she's joining the challenge. She's brilliant, and she has just such a great perspective on all things women's health and women's empowerment. And she's very interested in pediatric dermatology, and she's just got such a great broad scope in her life. And I just am so excited that we connected and that she's doing this challenge with us. So Dr. Gazzari, tell us all about you and introduce yourself to everyone listening. Thank you so much for having me. That was like such a sweet introduction. So yes, as you said, I'm a dermatologist. I own and run um, my own private practice in Orange County, California. I have three little kids, age seven and a half, six and two and a half. And, you know, to say that my life is busy is an understatement. So Nutrition was definitely one of the things that I neglected in my life. And first, I was so excited to have found your page and um, Instagram page and learn from it. And then I was beyond excited and honored when you invited me to join this challenge. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining the challenge. We are so excited that you wanted to join this challenge, that you emailed me and that you wanted to go plant-based. I mean, that's just so thrilling to see that you've had an interest in this. And the first thing I want to ask you is, so what even made you want to try going plant-based this summer? So first and foremost, who doesn't want a cardiologist to be in charge of changing her diet? And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was a no brainer. But, um, you know, as I said, like nutrition was one of the things that I felt like I'd neglected in this busy life. And I was looking for a way to make changes for myself, for my children, for my family. Um, And this seemed to be like the perfect opportunity to kind of make a huge change, but do it under supervision and your guidance of your team and also your amazing community that have been very gracious in giving tips and encouragement to me. So I wanted to kind of introduce my children 
to a little bit of a more healthier like lifestyle and knew that in order to do that, I need to be the example. So that was the main personal incentive to do this. And ultimately to help my patients. So, you know, you know that as dermatologists, many systemic disease have these skin manifestations. And I see a lot of people who have general diseases that come up in our sessions and in our clinic. Specifically, like I see a lot of kids and I can't tell you how many times we've seen that like darker velvety skin around the back of the neck of the children what we dermatologists call acanthosis nigricans. And then we start talking about obesity, diabetes, the lifestyle changes. And I found myself kind of coaching them and talking to them just because I take an interest in like having a conversation about their overall health in addition to their skin health. And I realized that I could use more tools and uh, more expertise to have that conversation and teach these children. But in order to not sound like a hypocrite, I had to practice it myself first. Well, that's amazing. I mean, I have so much respect for dermatology because first of all, the skin is our biggest organ. And there is so much that essentially with our health and wellness that comes out through dermatology, through our skin, through, you know, rashes, certain so many systemic illnesses, we end up seeing emerging through our skin and through how you look on the outside. And so I think it's fascinating because it really is, you know, so much of our overall health and overall wellness is reflected in what you see as a dermatologist. And so I think it's it's going to be a good, a good experience. It'll be a nice way to meld in and add into your practice. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I actually do think that one point you had that was really interesting that we had talked about off air that I would love for you to kind of um, talk about. We were talking about how, you know, um, with regards to the way we grew up and what nutrition was like with our families. And I thought that your little anecdote about your mom being a retired pediatrician nutrition and the way you grew up eating was really interesting. Yeah, so I grew up in Middle East and I my mom is a retired pediatrician now, so I grew up with a pediatrician mom and she actually never really cared about what we eat and was in one of those like strict parents about what we eat. So I kind of adopted that parenting style into my life. Um, but then I had a moment like about last year that I had to pause and think about why didn't she care about what we ate? And I realized that because we were in Middle East and our main diet was this Mediterranean diet full of fruits and vegetables, like she didn't need to be as strict. Like I remember we were allowed to watch one hour of TV every afternoon and the snack we ate was either a like little container of tangerines that we just peeled and ate out of the box or a half a watermelon and two spoons that my mom gave to me and my sister and we would just go at it. So as a kid... I would actually ration my chocolate or candy or M&M so that they would last longer because they were not available. They were not readily available. So I realized that when my mom was parenting us, fruits and vegetables were so predominant and sugar and candy and processed food was so rare in our community that she didn't have to worry about it. But now I'm raising children in an environment which is completely opposite. Processed food and high sugar food are so readily available and it's the culture. So I need to change my ways and kind of teach them about that that's not that's not really the real food that they should be eating. So that's when I realized this was about last year that I need to make a change. And I've tried a couple of things, but um, never like jumped into something full fledged like this program that you put together. Oh, that's great. Well, that's so fascinating. I I do really like that because I think that um, especially um, some of the really interesting areas of the world, it's been very much discussed by the blue zones, um, areas of the world that people live the longest, where we have the most centurions, people that live over 100, or these areas where people are eating like you describe, where they're eating lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, they're snacking on nuts and, and things like that. There aren't, they aren't eating M&Ms all the time, you know, and and like now in American culture, it's so easy to get processed food for kids. It's just so readily available. It's there. It's everywhere. Um, so it's just such an interesting point. I love that story about your mom because it's so similar to my family. Like I grew up with my parents just very much um, just we always had fresh fruits, vegetables in the house. So for me, my transition to actually plant-based nutrition was not that hard because I was very used to eating a lot of whole foods. And I think that it's going to be something really great for your kids to experience too. Hopefully they like some of the recipes you try. So about my mom, I actually remembered something that I wanted to throw in there too. I actually, about a few months before this challenge, 
I was driving to pick up my kids and I had my mom with me and I'd come across your podcast and she was having problems with her blood pressure, even um, though she was on medication and, um, you know, both being physicians under the care of the best cardiologist we could have found here. So I told her, just listen to this podcast. I don't remember exactly which episode it was, but we had enough time by the time we picked up and dropped off the kids to listen to the whole podcast. And I said, just listen to this podcast. And then after, um, and I bragged a little bit about you and your credentials, <laughs> obviously, to get her interest. And mm-hmm. then after after that night, I told her, just give it a try. Just do 10 days of it, 10 days of it, two weeks of it. And then let me know how you feel. So I I, I threw my mom in first to be the... Uh, <laughs> I love it. And then after a couple of weeks, I realized when I would make her coffee and I would say, oh, would you like me to put some cream in it? Or do you want to eat lunch with me? She was very restrictive. And she was like, no, I don't eat meat. I don't eat that. And I was like, oh, oh my well, gosh. what the one? So she actually told me that a lot of those fluctuations in her blood pressure she had has gone away. And even though wow. she's not like fully plant-based, but she tries her best um, to be compliant with what, um, you know, you recommended in that episode. So wow. you know, my mom is like, you know how physicians are by being one of the worst patients I've ever known. <laughs> and the way she was adhering to this plant-based diet or at least predominantly plant-based so impressive, that that actually had a lot to do with me joining too. It was like, if my mom is a believer, you know, like my mom and also being someone who I know doesn't really do much for her health. I was like, this is something that I should definitely do. So I thought that that story was also that's beautiful. I'm so honored. Shout out to your mom if she listens to this episode. <laughs> I love it. I mean, yes, first of all, you are 100% right that us doctors are most frequently the worst patients. And I can attest to that. I, I think we all are just like, we're, you know, we think we know what we're doing. And we don't always but we definitely are notoriously bad patients. But I think your mom is sounds, oh my God, that's so amazing. Especially hypertension is one of those things, especially that I've said this on multiple episodes. It's one of those medical issues that I'd say for 90% of my patients, once they go plant predominant or plant-based, their blood pressure drops so fast that it's almost, it, it's almost made me nervous. I have to check in with them faster because sometimes their blood pressure just drops so fast. They don't even need almost all of their medications within a month, or, you know, they can at least half many of their medications within a month. And so I actually uh, have in my program for anyone that's going full on plant-based that is um, going to be, that is on a uh, blood pressure medication, I actually make sure they either have a home blood pressure monitor or that they're checking in with us within four weeks because I found people become hypotensive because they just, hypertension is one of the easiest things, I think that and diabetes, one of the most successful things to reverse through nutrition. And it's multifactorial, um, of course, based on sodium, processed foods, things like that. And I just think it's so rewarding, especially for patients who are like, oh, I'm off all my blood pressure medications now. This is nice. And so um, I'm happy for your mom. I think that's that's great. Well, thank you. Well, with regards to your busy, busy schedule, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you foresee being some of the biggest limitations in transitioning to a plant-based diet? What are you worried about missing the most or what are your biggest concerns? So I think for me, the hardest part is going to be dairy because I'm not a big meat fan as much, even though I do enjoy like a steak here and there. Um, but dairy, especially in my coffee, like I can't even imagine a life without a creamer. So that is going to be really hard. I, Wait, um, so you need to you need to get a dairy free creamer. You need to get like there's coconut milk, there's soy milk, there's almond milk, there's oat milk. Have you tried any of them? I have. I'm in the <laughs> process of trying all different things to see if I can find a good match for how. Okay, okay, good. That's the hardest part. And then um, cheese because it's so predominant in everything we eat. I didn't realize how many things have cheese in them that I don't necessarily eat them because of the cheese, but it's just kind of the flavor and the taste. And then I was a, you know, I eat eggs on a regular basis. So those are the probably the harder part. And then um, another massive area of challenge is that I'm a sushi lover. And, um, you know, at least twice a week, we eat out and we eat sushi. So those are going to be the hardest challenge. So I'm trying to find, you know, the alternatives for the dairy and the eggs, and then they have to make some um, adaptation for the seafood part. 
Absolutely, there is definitely um, so many great dairy, dairy alternatives now available everywhere. I love multiple different kinds of the dairy cheese alternatives. I love Tree Line, um, Miyoko's, um, are both fantastic. And then even making your own cheese, there's a bunch of recipes that I'm sure Karen uh, sent you and ones that I've given you guys for making your own cashew cheese sauce and things like that. So a lot of the nut cheeses are really great. And then with regards to the creamer, I promise you'll find one with the texture you like. A lot of people find oat milk to be very similar in texture. And then there's coconut milk and there's like a zillion different kinds. You just have to definitely just, you know, trial and error and see if anything is appealing to you. And I think preparation is a huge part of this. I didn't realize that how much, like how much there is available, but how much you actually have to proactively get for yourself and prepare and, you know, be aware of. Because, you know, when you want to use these alternatives, you have to have planned to have them around when you need them. So that's, I think, the way we shop also needs to change significantly. Right. I, it's so funny, though, because it's so it's so true. I always say, yeah, preparation for transitioning to a plant-based diet is key. But the way I think of the way we are now, like the way I live, like I'm, a, you know, a cardiology fellow. I sometimes I'm working 80 hours a week or whatever. And like I'm, I don't do meal prep or, you know, I don't do any of that. I just eat like a normal person that just doesn't eat meat or dairy. And so I find that you're right. Like it's just in the beginning, it takes some preparation and there's a learning curve, but then it just becomes your normal life. So like I just go to work and eat my normal, you know, food that I either bring or, you know, whatever. And so it's, it becomes easier. At first it seems like this whole like brand new, like bizarre, you know, universe where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be eating cheese made from nuts and all these things. But once you try some of them and you find ones you like, it's just like going grocery shopping. It becomes routine like anything else, you know? Absolutely. And I think education part, because to you, it's probably now second nature. Like exactly. I, can't that, I can't have that. For me, it's like looking at every label and it takes a lot of like preparation. I found myself in cafeteria um, of our hospital the other day and like going through and seeing, can I have that? Can I not have that? But yeah. <laughs> next week, I'll know that that's my place. That's my station. That's the place to go. You know, That's like, such a good point. It's so hard. I, I do find, to be honest, I do find hospital cafeterias tough. I do. I will say I bring my own food to work because I, I find, I mean, there is the salad bar, but you know, like the, it's hospital cafeterias can be tough. There's a lot of like fried chicken everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, well, thank you so much. Thank you. This is amazing. And you have an amazing community who like already are reaching out and giving pointers and support. And I'm excited to see where this takes us. Well, now it's your community too. So um, all right, let everyone know where they can find you on Instagram. Okay, so I am Heidi Godarzy MD on Instagram. I'm at Heidi Godarzy MD, H um, H E I D I G O O D A R Z I M D. Excellent. And this is your community now. So everyone that's out there that listens to Nutrition Rounds, please give a follow to all of the doctors that we've interviewed and have a listen to their progress throughout the summer. They're all going to be sharing some of their stories through social media. And additionally, we'll check in with them in a month or so uh, for the podcast because we want to see how they're all doing. And, you know, I'm just so thankful that you're doing this with us, Heidi. And I think that everyone's going to be cheering you along and the rest of the doctors along because we all want you guys to give this a try and get the most out of it you can this summer. Thank you so much. And now we are with Dr. Fahad Samarkandi, who is a emergency medicine physician. He's so all the way over in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Hi, Dr. Fahad. Hi, Dr. Daniel. How are you? I'm just so excited to have you on here. And I'm so excited for you to be sharing this experience with all of our listeners from all the way across the world. And so I first wanted to just start out, you know, introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about you and what kind of medicine you practice and everything like that. Yeah. So thank you so much for inviting me into this and uh, for choosing me out of hundreds of physicians. Uh, my name is Fahad Samarkandi. I'm from Saudi Arabia. I did my residency training here in Riyadh in emergency medicine, and I practice here in uh, Security Forces Hospital. And uh, yeah, so I started to learn about vegan and plant-based diet probably maybe three or four years ago. I wasn't really convinced. I think the main reason I wasn't really convinced is that uh, still uh, men 
worldwide organizations and uh, well-known references, they don't clearly specify plant-based as the superior or the better uh, diet plan. Uh, this includes, for example, uh, for example, the American Heart Association and uh, up-to-date website. Well, so for actually, so for this year, so I'm, uh, as you know, I'm a cardiology fellow. And this year, the AHA ACC guidelines for nutrition were essentially um, very plant predominant. Um, They suggested, you know, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes as healthful. And they, the only thing that was still remained in the AHA ACC guidelines was fish. I think that that may change with the data that's emerging with TMAO and different research that's coming along. But it's very, very, at least from the cardiovascular standpoint, a plant predominant diet is very supported. So what is the, what's food like in, with regards to plant-based versus animal protein in the Middle East? How do you, how do you see it at this time? You see at this time, uh, uh, veg- veg- that is extremely rare here. I mean, there are people who didn't hear about it. If you tell them tofu or tell them uh, plant-based milk or pr- plant-based yogurt, they look at you and they think either you're crazy or you're just trying to fool them. They don't know that uh, this, these things exist. So uh, the knowledge here is very low uh, regarding plant-based diet. It's not familiar. It's very common for people to consume uh, chicken and dairy products every day and eggs. And uh, I think I think uh, it's uh, not not the individual fault. It's uh, the media and the information around him and the community around him. So right. uh, it, it, I, it, it, I think it's very difficult to change the perspective of uh, a society. Maybe you can uh, influence some individuals, but what about uh, big societies, big cultures? I think this is right. the big challenge here. Yeah, of course. It's absolutely. And um, I think that's a really good point. Um, But I'm so excited that you are here to try this with us and to be able to represent and share what you learn through this transition with everyone in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, being an emergency medicine physician and me in cardiology, we have a lot of crossover. So I'm sure you see acute Um, coronary syndrome, things like that. So as an emergency medicine physician, how much do you think that you see on a day-to-day basis could be prevented with lifestyle modification? I think almost every single patient. So I see uh, in emergency department, of course, we we see the acute uh, stages of uh, diseases that are uh, mainly caused by diabetes, by hypertension, by hyperlipidemia. When we see a myocardial infarction, most patients will be diabetics, hypertensive, and uh, hyperlipidemic. And we see a lot of uh, disease and infections, uh, fractures, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I think that sometimes when I talk to my patient, I try to counsel them uh, regarding diet. But I, I feel uh, very uh, hesitant to mention plant-based uh, just bluntly but because I, 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 in the few minutes I have encountering my patients, I, I cannot just uh, do this culture shock and convince them in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I think in one patient recently, I, to, I told him clearly, stand away from uh, animal products and uh, dairy because basically he was a, a, rectal, CA, a rectal cancer patient. He was visiting the emergency every day with uh, lower pain. Wow. And uh, I... Basically, he didn't have uh, something serious. It's just the tumor is compressing his uh, rectum. So I advise him that uh, I, this I, may be the only patient that I advise clearly. Just go plant-based, try uh, plant-based dairy, and uh, try not to eat chicken. Maybe you can replace it with beans or tofu or whatever. And uh, after this, he, he never came again. I don't know. He became better. He died. <laughs> but hopefully, he became better. Oh, wow. Well, like, I have to give you so much credit for even trying. I think actually, um, emergency medicine is one of the hardest areas to counsel about diet. And I give you so much credit for making that attempt. Because I know during my internal medicine residency, I when I rotated in the ED, I remember just feeling like, you know, you're 
just seeing one acute issue after another. And it's tough to bring up lifestyle modifications, not like in the outpatient where we sit down and we have time to kind of bring it up. But I think I give you so much credit because it's true. So much of the disease we see as physicians on a day-to-day basis is based on nutrition. And what I always say is that, you know, to gain the benefits of prevention and lifestyle modification, you know, we don't need to tell our patients that they all have to go 100% plant-based and 100% vegan, but a plant predominant diet and cutting out processed foods and cutting out things like as much dairy and red meat and animal products in general can be incredibly helpful for reversing diabetes and hypertension. And so I definitely think that you know, being culturally sensitive is important because obviously in different areas, people are accustomed to eating different things. But I think if we approach with our patients, that kind of standpoint where just trying to make a shift, even if it's gradual, even if it's small changes, you know, that can make a difference because so much what we see as doctors is preventable, you know? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh you know, I, I feel it's so sad for some patients who develop like chronic complications, incisional disease, and they are suffering every day. When I think that this uh, could have been uh, very preventable, and they only, I think they only lack the knowledge and the, uh, the support to, uh, to change. Well, then I just am so honored that you are doing this with us. And me and Karen are going to help you transition to plant-based nutrition fully this summer with the four other physicians that are joining this challenge. And I am just so thrilled and honored that you're doing this with us. And I hope that you can go back and share all of this with everyone in Saudi Arabia. So that way they can understand your experience and learn from everything that you're going to get out of this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So thank you so much. And Dr. Fahad is Supernova 3000 with um, the O in in Supernova is a zero. And then that's his Instagram. And his Twitter is changing the game, except the is T-E-H. He is tagged in um, my Instagram post from today. And additionally, you'll be able to link to his Instagram in the show notes on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahad, for doing this podcast with us. And thank you for joining in this challenge. We're so excited to have you. So guys, you've heard from all the doctors that are joining the challenge, except for one, Dr. Mo. She's a cardiology fellow. She's absolutely amazing. She lives in Michigan. She wasn't able to make it for an interview this week. She's in Florida and Disney with her family, which I am so excited for her, but she's super excited about trying plant-based nutrition for the summer and she plans to stick with it. So I want you guys to all root for Dr. Mo. You can find out all of her info um, in the show notes and also on my social media posts about the challenge. And she'll be checking in with us halfway through the summer in order to let us know how she's doing. And thanks guys for listening and thank you for enjoying Nutrition Rounds. I love being able to share all of this exciting different nutrition information with you guys as well as these lives of these fantastic five physicians that are transitioning to plant-based diet. And so much is in store for this summer. I Words cannot even describe the excitement I have over the episodes that are coming. I mean, the episodes coming are some of the best ever. They are just these outstanding scientists, physicians, just humans. And so I just, I can't wait for you guys to listen. So thanks again for tuning in. Mm-hmm.